Okay, hello everyone. I'm Andrew. Uh, like he said, I'm a software engineer at Google working on Beam Performance. I have Brian here with me to talk about some of our work from the past year. Yeah, hey, and I'm, yeah, I'm also Brian Hewlett. Like everybody has said so far, I'm also a software engineer at Google um, Yeah, and a Beam committer. Let's jump into the agenda. So we're first going to introduce what we're talking about when we say relational beam. You know, what do you mean? What do we mean by that? Um, so we're going to introduce some of the, the concepts that we have in, in beam that are relational. Uh, and then we'll get into some of the work that we've done with relational beam over the past year, I guess, since, since the last beam summit. Um, so I'm going to present some of the work that I've been doing, moving us towards enabling columnar processing and vectorization in the Python SDK. And Andrew's going to present some work that our, our colleague did, enabling uh, projection pushdown in Java IOs. Um, and then finally, we'll get into a little bit of um, you know, practical best practices, things that you can do in your pipelines that will help to, to take advantage of some of this work. So relational, you might be wondering what that is. I'm going to start by telling you what relational is not. Beam. OK, Beam is not relational. Uh, it traditionally processes opaque records. And so what is this? Internally, Beam represents your data as an array of bytes. Um, the object form is really only provided for user convenience. Uh, it's not something that we do anything more with. Uh, coders are are the mechanism for translating those objects to an opaque stream. But all Beam knows how to do is pass around bytes. It turns out your data is relational. So it has structure. Uh, it has a schema. Sometimes it has order. Um, our traditional Beam APIs aren't are equipped to take advantage of that. We don't have any of that information at runtime. And we don't have any of that information at pipeline expansion time. Uh, so in order to do that, we need a few things in the SDK. First, we need to know about the structure of your data. So what is that byte array? Um, this, is, this is really where Beam schemas come in. Um, what columns do you have? What are the names of them? What are their types? Um, and how much data can we expect from a collection? How big is it? Um, second, we need to know about the, the metadata about your computations. So like, what columns are you accessing? What transforms are you performing? There's a lot to really, uh, a lot of information that we need that we don't have. Yes. And so yeah, why do we need that information? Why do we need to bother with, with making Beam relational? Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. First, it's it's good for Beam developers. So us, as we're we're working on Apache Beam, uh, it makes it easier for us to build better APIs for you as users to use. Um, so it lets us do things like uh, have better interoperability between runners and SDKs. So the you know we can communicate better between the runner and the SDK, and then also between SDKs for like multi language pipelines. Um, and, it, and it enables us to build new classes of optimization. So some of the stuff we're going to be talking about later with vectorization and pushdown, these are things that we, are, uh, we as Beam developers are able to build into Beam um, when we have these relational concepts there. Um, and because we're able to build those things, it's better for you as, as Beam users. So it lets us build higher level, or higher level simpler APIs that tend to be more declarative and let you, you know, describe what you want to do rather than using sort of lower level Beam APIs where you're, um, where you're describing how exactly you want to do it. Uh, and then because we're able to, to build these optimizations into Beam, it ends up, it will usually end up yielding better performance for Beam users as well. Um, so what do we need here? Uh, if you go back to, you know, before we had any relational concepts in Beam, the only thing we had there was uh, structured coders in Beam. So we had, you know, windowed value coder, KV coder. These were, these were concepts in Beam that we had that we called structured coders, which exposed some amount of structure about your data, but really just like the minimal amount, just at what the, like, the absolute, what was absolutely necessary for communicating between runners and workers. So, you know, we have windowed value coder because you have to compute, can, you have to, the SDK has to communicate what are the timestamps and windows of your data. We have KB coder so that we can do group by keys. 
Um, but beyond that, everything is an opaque value. We don't give, you know, it doesn't, uh, these coders don't expose any structure of your actual, any of the underlying structure of your data um, beyond that. So we need to have more coders in Beam that actually, or a coder in Beam that actually exposes some metadata about the structure of your data. Um, and so we have that today. Now in Beam, we have Beam schemas and Beam rows that, uh, you know, a schema is a concept that describes what is the, what is the structure of your data and a Beam row is an instance of that uh, data type. Um, we have both of these abstractions in Beam in the Java SDK and we've extended it over into the Python SDK. Um, now also in Go and in TypeScript, I think is like fully embraced you doing things with, uh, with Beam schemas. Um, so we have we have these abstractions in Beam now. Um, so that's uh, you know moving us in the in the right direction. So beyond knowing what your how your data is structured, we also need metadata about your computations. We need to know what you're doing with your data. And this is really easy if you write everything in a SQL or maybe data frames. But use SQL Transform is what I'm trying to say. Um, if you just give us Java bytecode, for example, we have no idea what you're doing with that data. Uh, we being Beam developers and, and internals of Beam SDK. So the more metadata we can obtain about your computations, uh, the more opportunity we have for optimization. And so this could actually be as simple as the function signature of your Pardo. Uh, what fields do you access? What transforms do you perform? Do you care about Windows? Um, so uh, if, you, if you also, if you're performing a one-to-one -one or a one-to-many transformation, so right now uh, there's no such uh, thing as a one-to-one -one transformation, but if we, if we add that additional metadata, that would be something that, that you could do. You could have a returning party, for example, and we could take advantage of that to, to do further optimizations. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, if you're not accessing the window and you have an element in multiple windows, we can simplify those computations. So really what we need at the, the uh, lowest level is this, this row expression. It's the most abstract. And unfortunately, this slide has been in my talks at the Beam Summit since 2019. Um, I, we haven't really figured out how to generalize the row expression and put it into Beam. Um, I could probably give a whole talk on this subject alone. So uh, a row expression is, is really just a couple of operations. You're doing maybe field access, and we have that. That's field access descriptor. Maybe you have some constants, and you're calling a function. So it, it, one way to express this is a very simple uh, SQL statement. It's the select and where from a SQL statement. Um, this, this information is, is easy if you have a specific SQL engine you're targeting. But if you want something generic, like Beam, where Maybe we have a bunch of underlying SQL engines, uh, or IOs with different underlying SQL engines, or even even just different SQL dialects that we support in in Beam itself. These actually become difficult. Um, particularly, it's this function call uh, aspect. So if you're doing simple things like equals, if you're if you're checking to see if a call is equal to some constant, that's easy. If you're doing something like applying a transform like trim. Uh, Go, go try some of the corner cases and trim on your favorite five SQL engines. You'll get slightly different results, it turns out. Uh, trim, substring, there's a couple other ones. Like it, all these, fu this function library is, is difficult. Um, and so it also causes problems like if your data types are floating point, every, every library has a slightly different implementation of floating point math. And then how errors are handled uh, are all slightly differently. So this, this call aspect is difficult. But it turns out we don't need a full row expression to do optimizations. We can do a lot with just that field access information. So the Java SDK, we have an easy way to express field access. Um, we have this field access descriptor concept. And so it allows you to describe the subset of fields that you're actually accessing in your transform. Um, you can also uh, use a field access annotation to explicitly access fields um, in a transform. And we hope to eventually enable vectorized execution automatically in Java, for example, uh, with that. 
So internally, uh, Google has a system that does runtime analysis on protos, which is really cool. Um, we're able to actually figure out what fields are being accessed based on uh, just runtime sampling of pipelines. And hopefully someday we can do that with either static analysis or maybe some runtime analysis on rows and be able to figure out what, what you're doing with this um, without you explicitly telling us. But you know, if we explicitly have that, there's a lot of optimizations we can perform and maybe we, we can get it indirectly. So really, uh, th there's a lot of optimizations we can perform, but we need help getting this metadata. So we've added some basic ways to get it in the SDK. For example, field access, SQL uses it everywhere. But we need, we need it used all over the place. We need IOs to take advantage of it. Uh, really, it's the biggest thing is we've got this, this schema IO and schema transform interface that allows um, IOs to, to both describe their output with schema types and uh, support column pruning, which I'm going to demo here in, in just a few minutes. Uh, right now, there's a very, very small subset of IOs that support those. Um, and for any of this to work, all of your IOs realistically need to support it. Um, hopefully, we'll be adding support for columnar IOs as well. And once that exists, we'll need even more work to, to have the, the standardized format that can communicate with the SDK about your, your metadata. I would like to say thanks to the Go and TypeScript SDK authors who've, who've turned all this schema stuff on by default. So all of their data types are, are schema aware. So we get a lot more metadata out of those SDKs than we would have, for, for example, for code that you write in, in traditional uh, Java SDK. Um, Brian, is there anything you'd like to add? Anything you'd like to request? Um, no, nothing, nothing else. Not till the end we'll, when we get to the best practices. OK. So now we're going to talk about what we've been up to over the last year. First, Brian is going to talk about Python columnar. There's going to be a nice uh, practical use uh, examples there, I think. And then I'm going to actually demo Java projection pushdown, which Kyle wrote. So why don't you take it from here, Brian? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm going to present what I've been working on since, since the last uh, Beam Summit, trying to move us towards enabling uh, vectorized processing of columnar data in, in the Python SDK. Um, and so if those words don't mean anything to you, I'll, I'll start off by kind of clarifying what I'm talking about there. Um, yeah, so first off, what is columnar? This is a, a graphic that I use, I guess, probably in every talk I've given at Beam Summit um, to kind of demonstrate the idea. But if you imagine you have so a, you know, a tabular data set that in this case, we have a, a data set with you know, three columns and a few rows. Uh, in order to do some analytic on that in, in your computer, you know, obviously you need to put that in memory. Uh, and if you want to lay out that data in your linear memory, you can either lay it out row major, which is sort of, you might think of that as like a, an array of C structs um, where the, every, all of the data that's in an individual row is adjacent in memory. So you have like one row and then the next row and then the next row. Or you can lay it out in memory column major where you have all the values for an individual column and then the next column and then the next column. Um, now, the, the sort of row oriented way is much more, uh, it tends to be much more comfortable and you know, it's sort of more of the default, right? So like in C, you, know, you can just deal with an array of C structs. Um, it, it's a little bit more painful to deal with the with the column major the column major layout. You have to keep track of like where are the boundaries between my buffers. What am I going to do if I need to add another element? Um, do I need to like move everything around so I can insert to, uh, append something at the end? Um, you know, you have to consider all of these additional factors. So you know that that seems complicated. Why would we really why would we bother with this columnar layout? Um, and the answer is the other term. So vectorization is what we want to enable with, these, with this columnar layout. Um, so vectorization, what I mean when I say vectorization is I'm just referring to the performance improvements that we can get by processing columnar data. Um, so in this, the, there's two different performance improvements that we'll get. The first one is, is not depicted on this slide. The first one is, is cache locality. So it tends to be that when we, when we do these analytics on relational data, um, you can you you get better 
cash performance. You get more cash hits as you uh, if you're analyzing your data that has a columnar layout. Um, and so if you get more cash hits, you know you get data into your processor faster, and you can process more data faster. Um, the other thing you can get is the other performance benefit you get is that people often talk about with, with vectorization is you can use SIMD instructions. So that stands for single instruction, multiple data. Um, so what that means is, you know, in modern processors and, you know, Intel and AMD processors and their instruction sets, they actually have special instructions that, you know, instead of just a simple instruction that takes two numbers and multiplies them together um, in, in one instruction, it will actually have, there, there are a variety of instructions that will take uh, batches of data. So it will take four, say like two four element arrays and bring those into the processor all at once and multiply them all together. Um, and so just like that, you know, you, if you're able to take advantage of these instructions, you know, you can get a four X performance win, um, for example, or, you know, whatever the cardinality of the, of the SIMD instruction is. Um, so, Again, though, you know, that vectorization, SIMD instructions, that's kind of like hard to take advantage of. Uh, but fortunately, in the Python world, you know, we have this whole ecosystem of scientific Python libraries that are already, you know, built around this framework. So they're already operating, you know, there's all these libraries like NumPy and Pandas and SciPy and TensorFlow where they, 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 they're built with this columnar vectorized model. Um, and you know, if you if you compile it right, they're able to use these uh, SIMD instructions and get all these performance benefits. Um, so that's great, but unfortunately, they require you to operate on batches of data, um, which is not quite compatible with the Beam model. So you know, in Beam, we have this model where you're supposed to be writing a pipeline that's that's processing individual logical elements, and that kind of flows through your pipeline. Um, and what ends up happening is, you know, our users and also in, in a lot of our, our beam code, our custom transforms and things, we have to do this, we have to have this kind of pattern where we first do a batch elements transform uh, to create a batch of data and then convert that to some data type like a NumPy array, which we can then use to do our computa computation. So then we're able to leverage this vectorized library there. And then on the output side, we need to take, again, the NumPy array, and then we need to explode it back out into, say, you know, a p-collection of integers so that then, you know, you can interoperate with the rest of your, with the rest of your pipeline. Um, so, you know, we have people, you know, users are doing this manually all over the place. We, you know, like I said, there are places in Beam that we do this. So we, you know, we, if you come to my talk about the data frame API later, you'll see we do exactly this batch elements flat map pattern. Um, on the input and output side of the data frame API in Parquet.io, the Parquet.io actually produces arrow record batches and then immediately explodes them out into Python dictionaries. Um, and so we're not able to just pass through those arrow record batches and, and uh, do some processing on them. And so because we have all of these different transforms and um, user code that's doing all this batching and unbatching manually, we don't have uh, you know, we're not able to sort of connect all these things together in, in an efficient way. Uh, so what I've been working on uh, recently is adding this concept of batch do funds. Um, and so there's a link for the design doc here if you want to take a look at that. But the idea with batch do funds is instead of writing, you know, a conventional beam do fund where you define a process method that accepts a single element at a time and, and outputs a single element or, you know, potentially multiple elements. Uh, we allow you to write a do fund that defines a process batch method. Um, and that process batch method is expecting to receive a, a batch of data. Um, so in this case, in the example I'm showing here, you know, you might have, a, instead of having a simple do fund that's taking an integer and multiplying it by two, you would take a, um, you would write a process batch method that takes a NumPy array of integers and multiplies them all to, by two simultaneously. Um, so I'm just going to give like a quick tour of some of the other features of you know how this how this batch do fun stuff works. So you can actually we let you we let you define both a process method and a process batch method. So it's a little bit of a risk there because you could have a divergence in in how you're um, in in the implementations there. So you know definitely you need to take care if this is something you're doing manually. I think um, in practice I you know really don't expect people to be building do funds that define both, but you, you can. Um, and 
so so the but you yeah you so you can define a process batch method and a process method um, and then what will happen is actually at execution time beam will decide you know which one is the better one to use so if you have uh, so if you're you know if you're depending on the inputs and outputs of this do fun if they're already batched up or if they're not batched up then we might just pass through the elements directly or we might pass through the batch through the process batch method. Um, the other reason that this process batch method or the, the ability to have this sort of element wise fallback is helpful is that most batch types in Python are actually ambiguous. So, you know, what I was showing you before with the, the NumPy array type hint, that's actually a type hint that we added for this work in um, specifically in Apache Beam. So it's a type hint that's parameterized by the element type and also the, the shape of the array if you want to specify it. Um, and so that's a, a special type hint that we added, but if you use sort of the default, you know, NumPy type hints and you just say, I expect a NumPy array, that doesn't declare, you know, what is, what is the actual element type of that data. So the, if you define a, a um, element-wise fallback, then that's able to sort of clarify that. You know, you can say, oh, this is a do fund that expects an integer. Um, and then we, when we were passing, when we would pass in a NumPy array, we would know that it should be a NumPy array of N64s. Um, this becomes even more apparent when we start to look at how is this going to work with schema data. So say you have a, um, your user type, like my row type, that is a, a type that we're able to infer a schema from. So this would be like say a name, a name tuple type that defines some, the, the structure of your data. Um, then we're actually able to use that to clarify the structure of the ambiguous data frame type. So when you, when you say data frame, you know, it just says, oh, this is, a, this is a pandas data frame, but it's not parameterized by like, what are the columns in this data frame? What are the individual types of the data frame? So we're able to look at the row type and from that infer what are the columns and what are the columns and the types of the data frames that you should be processing um, at execution time. And then we want this to extend to other structured data types as well. So other batched structured data types, like for example, a pi arrow record batch. So, you know, again, you'll be able to infer from, you know, the, the structure of your row type, what should be the columns in your, your pi arrow record batch. So the um, last little bit I wanted to talk about is how this interacts with, you know, the critical feature of Beam, which is timestamps and windowing. So, um, you know, how are you able to, to deal with timestamps with uh, these batch do funds? So right now what we have available in, as, as of the latest release, as of BM 2.40, is you can use um, what we call a homogeneous windowed batch. So that means that all, we're, all of the elements, all of the logical elements in your batch must have the same timestamp. Uh, so you can, so then, and then you can, you can retrieve those and define those as, as we're showing here. So you can, in your process batch method, you can, just like in a do fun, you can define a parameter called, you know, timestamp or whatever, and you give it the beam.dofun.timestamp param, which also, you know, also works on a process method. And then at execution time, we're gonna call that and pass in the timestamp. Um, but we only pass in a single timestamp. So it's just one timestamp that applies to all of the logical elements in your batch. Uh, and then similarly on the output side, you can declare a timestamp by instead of yielding a windowed batch, you yield what we call a homogeneous windowed batch. So that the first element of that homo or the first argument of that homogeneous windowed batch, similar to windowed value, is the actual data. And then you would be able to specify a timestamp and a window or a set of windows that's going to apply to that to that batch. The uh, the other thing that we have here that unfortunately is not not available yet, but was proposed and you know agreed upon in the in the batch do funds design doc is this idea of a heterogeneous windowed batch. So instead of having you know having this pretty strict strict requirement that your batch has to have all of the same timestamps, um, we wanted to be able to support this heterogeneous format. So then you know that would work instead of instead of the, um, having your the using the do fund dot timestamp param, you would use do fund dot timestamp batch param, and then at execution time we call we would call that with a sequence of timestamps that apply 
to all of the logical elements in your batch. And those could, you know, obviously be uh, potentially different. Uh, and then similarly on the output side, you would be able to produce a heterogeneous windowed batch where the timestamps are, um, where you provide a sequence of timestamps that apply to everything in the batch. And yeah, just to be clear, you know, this part is not, not something that you're able to use now. Um, it's just something that has been designed and we need to implement still. Um, yeah, so what's next for this? So, you know, we built all of this infrastructure. Um, I, you know, now we kind of need to use it. Now we need to uh, use it in a way that's going to be useful for you as Beam users. I think I, I really see this as sort of a, a lower level API. That's something that we're going to be using in other places throughout Beam um, and that other library developers will be using it. So, for example, the people developing TFX um, or X-Array Beam, those, those sorts of libraries. Um, and so, you know, now that we've built this infrastructure, we need to use it in places like in the Beam Data Frame API. So when we do conversion between schema-aware P collections and deferred data frame objects, we want to be using this batch do fun concept there. That's going to help us enable doing windowing with the data frame dot rolling operation. Um, you know, and really in all of those other places that I that I mentioned earlier. So in in Park AIO, where we're doing the PIO record batches that we're exploding into dictionaries. We need to use this, this concept there. Um, also in run imprints, run imprints is doing this batching and unbatching um, that you know we really want uh, would prefer that the batch do fun concept there is is being being used there to manage the batching. Um, and another thing that I'd really like to look into is you know I mentioned before that I don't anticipate most people will ever actually implement both a process batch and a process method. Um, I really think that you know the ideal case there is what what will happen is that users will provide something like a process method. So they might just write a simple beam.map that's supposed to process individual elements, but then we could use um, something like number.vectorize or jax.bmap, which um, you know takes a function and turns it into a vectorized version that processes batches of data. Um, so we would, you know, users would just define basically a process method and we would generate the equivalent process batch version for them. Um, so then in that case, we, you know, we don't really, there's no concerns about like, is it actually the same logic because we've generated the equivalent logic for them. So, all right, I think that's it for batch do fun. So I'll hand it over to Andrew to talk about projection pushdown. Okay, thank you, Brian. So let's talk about some Java. Everyone likes Java, right? OK. Um, so uh, we've recently actually added a basic relational optimizer to Java core. I'd like to recognize Kyle Weaver, who couldn't be here, but he wrote this. Uh, you probably have seen him on the mailing list if you're subscribed to the dev mailing list or maybe gotten some customer support from him. Um, so if you remember earlier, uh, we have field access metadata in the Java SDK. And so we also have this thing called schema transform that allows your, your schema to advertise various features. Um, one of those is the ability to, to push down fields. So this is if you have a column that you're reading from your data store, and um, um, particularly uh, if you have a set of columns you're reading from your data store and you have another set of columns that you're not reading, we can tell your, your data source to not send us the set of columns you're not reading. Uh, currently, only uh, BigQuery I.O. supports this. Uh, sorry. Uh, but we need help adding it to all the other I.O.s. Um, it is actually a pretty simple interface. So from a user perspective, um, I'm going to demo this sort of as a, a, a walkthrough of a test case. I'm, I'm not brave enough to run a live test on the stage. And also, this is not my laptop. Uh, but so we got a simple block of code here. This, this probably looks like a, a very, very simple pipeline. But it's actually a test case that's checked into Beam. Um, so if you want to go and run this in the, the slide, a speaker notes is a link to the actual test case. Uh, it's a pretty simple pipeline. Uh, you know, it, it reads some stuff from BigQuery, converts it to Beam row. Um, it's running a custom pardo uh, called git int field, which does what it says. I'll show you that in the next slide. And um, then it then it performs a count and verifies that, OK, you got the number of records you expected. It's, so it's very much a test case. 
but you can do you can do anything. The, the key piece here is this git in field that's right after your BigQuery I/O. So if if I was to to naively write git in field, I'd write something maybe that looks like this. Um, I've got a simple process element with a process context. I'm going to get my element. I'm going to get my in field, and I'm going to output it. Unfortunately, this won't optimize at all. So any any time you use process context in Java, you have unrestricted access to everything. Um, for example, you have access to the, the raw input element. You have access to the window information. We could possibly do some sort of static analysis to figure out what, what you're doing in your, in your function, but it'd be a lot better if you just told us what you're doing. So here's a little bit more complex version of this. Um, this is this is sort of the the advanced use case. I'm starting there. Um, okay, you, you've told us that you you only care about this single field in row, which is int field, and uh, you have a process element function that's going to actually pull in your row and give you an output receiver. So now we know that you're never looking at the window and you're only looking at this int field column. The, the actual body of the function has not changed here. Uh, only the function signature. Uh, this does support pushdown. We would be able to detect that you're only using in field. There's actually a simpler way to write this if you're willing to change the code that your uh, uh, process element implementation uses. You can tell us, hey, I, I want you to turn uh, this one field that I care about, or any number of fields you care about, on your input data into, into arguments that are passed in your process element. And I'd actually recommend using this because uh, it, it enables some other auto vectorization potentially in the future. Um, but what you're doing here is, is you're, you're not processing rows, you're processing columns. <laughs> uh, OK, so you've told us that you're actually you're telling us the columns that you care about, and you're manipulating those columns in your function, and you're not getting the full row. Um, and so here's something that I want to add in the future. This doesn't exist yet. But for this use case, it's actually a one-to-one -one mapping. And we should totally support you having a process element that returns. So you can just, hey, I just took in that one field element, and I returned it. Uh, this, this, I would say most, most process elements will be more complex than this. But this is an example. Uh, for a one-to-one -one mapping, we can do some internal optimizations that will allow us to uh, give you more performance. Um, just by knowing that it's a one-to-one -one mapping. So this is this is not a live demo, like I said earlier. Um, I, I've gotten sort of an example here. This, so I ran this command from our test cases, and there's a key log line that I've highlighted here. Um, optimizing transform BigQuery I/O uh, will contain reduced set of in fields. So. This is, this is the log line that will be produced in any pipeline that is our optimizers run on. And it said, OK, I've detected that you're only, you're only reading the int field column, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop all of the other columns when I read from BigQuery I.O. Um, and so first I ran this, this pipeline without the optimization. I disabled the, the optimization. There's actually, it's on by default from batch. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so I disabled it. and the I don't know if you could read that. It's very small. But the key bit here is you've got this pretty simple graph. There's no indication that pushdown occurred. We processed 11 million elements and 1.2 gigabytes of data for BigQuery. So it's a test pipeline. That's pretty small. But uh, nothing, nothing indicates pushdown happened. So I ran it without pushdown disabled. There's additional metadata. So this is the BigQuery, or the BigQuery. This is the data flow UI, if you're not familiar with it. Um, but this is this is just uh, this works on uh, any runner that you. It's just generic Beam SDK uh, functionality. Um, anyway, uh, we populate display data, so you can see what's going on in in data flow if you use that. Uh, you'll note here that it, it's it's annotated your BigQuery I/O with a selected field of int. Uh, projection pushdown applied is true, so you have some metadata there. It's the same 11 million records, but now we've only processed 190 megabytes. Um, and so this is the the amount of savings is is very dependent on your data set, but by doing pushdown, we've gone from 1.2 gigabytes to 190 megabytes, so a, almost a 10x improvement. Um, there are use cases where we've seen uh, pipelines just not run without pushdown. You turn pushdown on, 
and now you can you can run the scale the scale it just is so much that it falls over without push down and so this could be like a large data set for example where you're looking at metadata and maybe your your database has in it like every image that's ever sent in your social media app uh, I don't know um, but uh, uh, you would traditionally you'd have to manually annotate this and with automation you don't have to do it and you still get the these savings of push down so like I said it only works with bigquery IO so far but that's not a limitation inherent in bigquery IO it's just we need some help implementing it in all the IOs. Uh, it's on by default in batch since Beam 2.38. So that's a couple months now. And the next Beam release is going to have it on by default for streaming pipelines. Um, the only the sort of caveat there is we were afraid to turn it on for streaming because uh, uh, it breaks some data flow upgrade stuff. There's a release note. Um, breaks. You're, you're, <laughs> It, 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 so if we go back to that, uh, someone's laughing over here at me, but uh, uh, it, it, it changes the schema of your data. And so if you have if you have this go through a group by key, you'll actually have the the the, the um, data type of your group by key change due to the the filter pushdown, and that could potentially break um, um, your. Uh, uh, upgrade ability on the data flow upgrade. So usually, though, you have you have an, like an IO followed immediately by some sort of transform that's doing some filtering before you do a group by key. So those get fused, and probably upgrade will work. Um, it's just sort of a fun quarter case. Anyway, best practices. I'm gonna go over again here some of the best practices how to take advantage of these features that we're building. So for Java, like I said in the in the, the sort of demo, uh, use use the field access annotation and use output receiver. Um, we have this this process context concept that a lot of our documentation historically has recommended. Hey, just 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 you know, just get the process context and you can do whatever. Everything in the process context is accessible in Java through these annotations or directly based on. Um, Passing uh, just them as function or as arguments to your process element function, and I there was actually a mailing list discussion about deprecating process context, and that's going to happen soon. I had a baby and disappeared for a while, but sometime I'm going to get around to actually deprecating process context, and uh, it'll solve this problem of accidentally using it and breaking optimizations. But um, it's really easy to, to change your pipelines now. Just prefer to use field access, output receiver, the window. Um, Annotation. You can do all of this on the the uh, function signature of existing process elements, and that's been supported by Beam since I don't know two ten, <laughs> so forever. Um, in Go, we don't we don't support any uh, uh, relational optimizations, but we do support um, SQL transform, and all of the built-in data structures generate uh, row and schema types by default. So if you if you are if you're in Go, great. Your data types are already taken care of. Just use SQL Transform when you can, uh, and actually use SQL Transform with Java too and Python. And then for Python, I'm gonna have Brian talk about that for a minute. Okay. Yeah, I, and I just realized we neglected to have a slide for TypeScript, but they're the same. The story is the same as Go. Uh, TypeScript was made to use schemas by default, um, so I don't think you need to do anything special there. Um, yeah. So in in Python, you know, the one thing that, you know, we have the big red X here, the one, the one thing that we want you to avoid is just operating on, uh, just operating on dictionaries. Um, you know, if you just have a do fun or a map or something that's just producing some dictionary, that's very difficult for us to be able to infer the, the structure of your data from. Um, so, you know, it kind of, makes it impossible for us to do any of these operation, uh, optimizations like the vectorization or, or the um, auto vectorization stuff that I was talking about or in the future, you know, if we start to do this push down work in Python, um, you know, if you're working just with Python dictionaries, you know, we wouldn't really be able to do that. So we really want you to be, to be using explicitly structured data types. So, you know, use a, a named tuple class, which we can infer a schema from, um, like we're showing at the bottom or, you know, 
uh, just yielding a, a beam row object, which we can also infer a schema from. And there's a link here for, for documentation about schemas that you can look at that has some more examples. And then the other thing that the other best practice that I'd recommend in the Python SDK is using using the relational transforms that we have there. So that's things like using beam.select, which lets you do a simple projection. So if you have a schema, a, a P collection with a schema, then you can pull out particular fields or do simple operations, create a new field that's like some operation on, on other fields. Um, and also using things like beam, uh, uh, beam by, which lets you do a grouped aggregation, um, potentially doing multiple aggregations on different fields in, in a much more concise way than you could have done previously with, you know, implementing a custom combined fund. Um, and, you know, these are both APIs that are things that we could potentially auto vectorize and also give us information about, you know, what you're trying to do in your pipeline that we can, so that we can try to optimize it in later versions of beam. Um, yeah, and then finally, we'd also recommend, you know, in, along the same lines, using the using the Beam data frame uh, API. So using some of those IOs, which you know, automatically the the Beam data frame API sources automatically retrieve a schema for for you, um, and you know you can you can even use that with conventional Beam by converting the defer data frame back to a P collection. If you are interested in data frames, I'd recommend you come to my talk later today as well, um, where we'll go into uh, the, you know, a tour of how it works and um, you know, a tour of what it looks like from the user perspective and also how it works under the hood. So. We have a question slide here. I got a couple more things I forgot. I should add a slide for, but just to give you some, some, some high level context here, um, like all of these things, like all these relational transforms are we're just starting to work on this. And really, like Brian and I both work at Google. We have access to all the internal metadata on Dataflow customers, but we're focused on, on Beam optimization. So uh, the hope is that you'll start using some of these, these APIs. We can figure out what optimizations will benefit Beam and Dataflow users, and we can build these into Beam. And so the hope is someday you'll be able to upgrade to a new version of Beam and just, just get like a 50% performance improvement, just upgrading a version. I think everyone would like that. So that, that's our goal. That's why we're trying to do this. That's why we're encouraging you to use these APIs. Anyone have questions?